Dzień dobry, witam Państwa serdecznie. To drugi dzień naszej konferencji. Rozumiem, że kilka emocjonujących sesji za nami. Trwają również rozmowy i wymiana doświadczeń w kuluarach. Przed nami za, za chwileczkę kolejne ciekawe doświadczenie. Zanim jednak do tego przejdziemy, trzy krótkie ogłoszenia, informacje. Pierwsza, świat przygląda się temu, co się dzieje na naszej konferencji. Jak, bardzo, jak Państwo widzicie, towarzyszą nam nie tylko kamery, ale także już w recepcji do odebrania e, najnowszy numer Gazety Krakowskiej, w której e, piszą o nas, e, piszą o tym, że w hotelu Best Western dyskutują, no właśnie, tak szanowne zgromadzenie, dyskutuje o zadaniach przywódcy w szkole. Zapraszam do odebrania gazety do bycia na bieżąco. Druga kwestia ważna, chciałbym przypomnieć o tym, że przed salą plenarną znajdują się laptopy. Przypominam o naszym zaproszeniu. Proszę z nich korzystać, dzielić się własnymi refleksjami i wpisywać je na naszym, na naszym blogu. I wreszcie trzecia kwestia. Wczoraj mu zapowiadaliśmy, że będą plakaty rozstawione w Lipczu czarty z plakatami, one już stoją. Na każdym z nich znajduje się, myślę, interesujący temat. Zapraszamy do dzielenia się refleksjami, do zapisywania własnych pomysłów. Wszystkie pomysły są ważne. Przed nami w tej chwili e, wykład e, Cynthia Tyson. Zapraszam serdecznie Państwa do wysłuchania. Cynthia, zapraszam. Good afternoon. I am happy that I did not have to show you my athletic ability and jump up on the stage. I want to say thank you very much for this invitation to speak with you. It really is for me a dream come true. As a very, very young child, I watched televised with my father the United Nations proceedings. And I said to him, why are they listening to music? And he says, they're not listening to music, they're listening to an interpreter who is helping with various languages. And I said, oh, I want to do that when I grow up. And he said, what? What language do you want to take? He was so excited. And I said, no. I want to be the person on the stage talking while everyone else listened in the various languages of all the world, listened to me. And, oh, thank you. And so when I spoke to my father this morning, he said, please don't say anything dumb in multiple languages of the world today. I will try to honor that, but I make no promises. <laughs> Today I will speak with you about your objective 2.6 that was shared with me. Processes occurring in the classroom, or I should say the school or center, activities that are carried out for the purpose of creating equal opportunities in education. My understanding of that is that in the schools and centers, there must be a taking account 
of the individual and the context of the schooling in the education process. This made me think of a song, and for those who were in the earlier session, they know I have lots of stories. But there is a song that I learned as a very young child in Sunday school. And the song goes like, I am a promise. I am a possibility. I am a promise. With a capital P. I am a great big bundle of potentiality. You probably could tell now that I had no self-esteem issues. But in my life as a student, there were very few teachers who saw me as full of promise, full of potential. I was one of the children from over there, from a community down there, no promise, no potential, no possibility. As educators and administrators all over the world, we are faced with children for whom we want them to show their promise and their possibility as we prepare them for the future. But here is the big question. How do we engage in teaching and learning in ways that will prepare students for a future that is full of promise and possibility when we are facing challenges to equity, or something you heard mentioned last night, inclusivity. This is especially a big question when so much of the world today is not about justice and is not about inclusivity. I believe that these things can be reached and accomplished from three things that I know a little bit about and shouldn't say anything too dumb about. Civic education, critical race theory, and teaching for social justice. It's also very, excuse me, Ooh. now I can see. I thought I'm on a stage. There's a spotlight. I already sang. Maybe I should dance, but I think Judge Off would not like that. At the core of both multicultural and civic education are essential concepts of democracy, equality, and civic participation. Although the tenets support an examination of what we call social justice, the placement of social justice and race or ethnicity at the center as a unit of analysis or a way to think and understand some phenomenon can help us critique all of the promises of democracy. For many, this initiative has only been done just recently in education. And as your colleagues across the pond, this is very true for us as well. Specific areas of teaching and research have included, but not been limited to, a few things. The development of political, and civic identity. The relationship between engagement and opportunities 
as it relates to social justice. Consequences, <coughs> pardon me, consequences of civic engagement, or I would say the lack of engagement, political participation, engagement as it relates to the context or what's happening in the culture of the schools and the ways in which that um, is created. So first, I will talk a little bit about social justice. Social justice is a big theoretical conversation. And I teach at a university where they pay me to think big theoretical things. I love it. But for those who heard me earlier, I used to teach kindergarten and first grade, grade one. And I could be as theoretical as I like. Somebody's shoes need to be tied. Someone does not want to share, you know, the, the things that are important as justice in those areas. So social justice, in theory, can help us critique or provide a lens to critically critique what happens in education for citizenship. It can help us move past traditional ways of thinking. Such a critique proposes how we can have standardized concepts of civic participation that include some and exclude others allow some to be included and others pushed to the margins. In addition to social justice theory, I'll also talk a little bit about critical race theory. And in conversations with John, who some of you know, we talked about this whole idea of race and how different it is constructed around the world. And I would ask you to walk and think with me a little bit about race theory as also being geographical. So in the United States, I think about race as it is socially constructed. But I can also think about geography because we have a huge debate around urban and rural and the ways that bringing a different lens to that can be helpful. I'm a social studies educator, and we have traditionally looked at lots of things around civic competencies as it relates to curriculum standards and teaching pedagogy. With a broader view that explores that whole big list of civic competencies that we like to teach and research. We define what it means to be a citizen, an engaged citizen. And as we look at that concept, we have to address a few things. We have to think about race. We have to think about ethnicity. We have to think about racism and classism, how much money a family has or does not have, sexism as we think about gender, and an increasing conversation around homophobia, same gender attraction. In this talk, I'll talk about social justice and critical race theory as just two frameworks that can help us begin to make this critique, education for citizenship, education for life. And after I talk about those two things briefly, I will share with you a few examples. One, and, and they're American examples because that's what I know the most about. I do know a few other things. But literacy acquisition after African enslavement will be one. And something in the states that was called the Mississippi Freedom Schools with the state of Mississippi and both of those being literacy activities. 
So when I talk about social justice, there's a couple ways that it's approached. We can go all the way back to Greek philosophy and pay attention to the fact that it was this universal concept that applied to everyone and sort of normalizing, making things culturally neutral, this is what it means. But we also have the principle of justice that looks at the common good, that looks at fairness, impartiality, choice, and reciprocity. And as we look at social justice in this way, we begin to say, well, this isn't just about control of the individual. It's going to provide a procedural process way to look at social justice. Two theorists that I like, because I told you I like theory. In the States, they call us theory heads. I'll let her catch up. Okay. I don't know whether to say thank you when someone says I'm a theory head or not. Uh, not sure. But there are two people that talk about this, uh, writer Alexander and Rawls. Rawls talks about social justice as being able to satisfy two conditions. The first one, it's about access and opportunity. That people should have equitable ways to get things. The second thing is of its greatest benefit, and that is that if social justice is going to work, it should benefit the least advantaged members of society. The least advantaged. Now, in both of those instances, they're talking about things that we can measure. And we know measurement and education is a big thing. But there was another theorist that I like to talk about, and that is Jung. And Jung talks about a different theory of justice, one that is about eliminating oppression. He talks about the ways in which the normal processes of life can be addressed if they are oppressive. So you have one group that is sort of logocentric, as it's called, and another group that's grounded and the more practical. Either way, there is a struggle because it is in the face of societal injustice that there is a call to action. Henry Giroux, who is um, an American theorist as well, talks about how the political, economic, and cultural inequities are interrelated so that in education you cannot separate the political. Often when I am working with pre-service teachers, they will say to me, I don't want to get political. And I ask them, how are you going to do that? Because everything is political. Teaching is a political act. And many people have written about that. The next thing I want to do is sort of talk a little more about the literature. Bill Ayers, who is um, another person who deals with theory and practice, which is what I like best, defines social justice in this way. Love, infused and hopeful vision teaching what is grounded or practical against the grain of governmental push and current trends. It's all about teaching in the hope of making the world a better place. Whatever the particular details may be, here is the most important point. Most all definitions and conceptions of social justice contain some very key distinctive components. The first one being respect for diversity and inclusivity. Coalition building across diverse lived experiences. Dialogue that is open across boundaries. 
individual agency within a collective public good. This is an important goal of social justice and education. Preparing teachers who then prepare students, children, to be accepted, accept, have more acceptance of cultural pluralism in their classrooms, in their communities, their society, and ultimately the world. The issue often is that when people have their basic needs met, are physically and psychologically safe, they are able to develop to their full capacities, and they are capable of interacting with others in a democratic sphere. I would add that a socially just society is composed of citizens whose minds and character consistently seek ju social justice and are really not at rest until justice is served. We wish for social justice, but sometimes in education we are divorced from it. I believe and want that children, when they take their place as world leaders, the United Nations being only one venue, when they are in places where they are facing decisions about keeping the world safe, that they are able to deliberate with people who think differently than they do, that they have the ability to keep an open mind, to be able to stand in another person's shoes and to change and to make decisions with others. That's what I saw as a young child as I watched the United Nations. I did get past the part of just wanting to be on the stage. I moved to understanding what it was about. So given this consideration of social justice, I want us to think a little bit about critical race theory. It's a, another framework for the examination of civic education or education in general. As I said, I'm a social studies educator who is very hot right now. I know this is on camera and I won't look as good, but you would not want me to pass out up here. That would not be good. Is this not good here? I can hide it. So. Oh, thank you. Okay. The National Council for the Social Studies in the States is a body that comes together to create the objectives for what it means to teach the social sciences from pre-K through high school. The most important thing is to create people or provide educational opportunities that would allow people to be effective citizens. And in order to do that, there's a list of things that they say must happen in the classroom. There's some core democratic values that people should strive to live by. A person should be responsible not only for themselves, but feel some responsibility for the well-being of their families and the community. They have some knowledge as it relates to the history and traditions of those same communities, our nation, and the world that they are aware of founding documents, that they are aware of events and issues that impact people on multiple levels, and that they also seek information in multiple ways, asking meaningful questions, and then actively participate in civic and community life. There's also this understanding of then what is civic education, which is not everywhere. I've been in other places of the world and when I talk about civic education, they look at me and say, well, what, what do you mean by that? All education is about preparing citizens. Only in the United States of America will we have a special course just for civic understandings. Maybe you have it here too. That was a joke. I was trying to make sure you were all still with me. Okay. This whole idea about the school and the classroom being able to manage culture 
along with democratic values, that when there are negotiations that need to be made across cultures and across experiences, that there is some value in a citizenship for us to be able to do that. That this whole idea about what it means to be a citizen is integrated across the curriculum. So there is no thing just mathematics, just reading, just literature. All of these things are a part of what it means to become a good citizen. Creating meaningful opportunities participate in governance as it relates to the school across experiences. And I'll just jump around. Um, finally, helping prepare students to become effective citizens is really explicitly organized as a part of the mission of the school. So before every student at every grade level can take what is called the office of citizen to be that possibility, attention must be given to the cultural and legal foundations that really underpin what is historically taught. This facilitates a departure sometimes from the traditional ways that we teach citizenship education. The use of the principles in critical race theory can really assist with that, and so I'll talk a little bit about that now. One very fundamental principle of critical race theory is that racism is a system of advantages and disadvantages based on race. It is socially constructed. There is nothing about my skin color, the phenotype of my skin, that is endemic to any way that I am as a person. It's a system of advantages and disadvantages. I would propose to you that that system of advantages and disadvantages could also be related to age, thereby giving us ageism. ageism. A system of advantages and disadvantages based on geography, as I mentioned before, where you live, if it's urban, if it's rural, if it's, you know, what part of urban versus urban. That it could be a system of advantages and disadvantages based on gender. A system of advantages and disadvantages that become institutionalized within society that either will allow access or deny access, and thereby creating oppression. Critical race theory really came about as a part of our, of our legal system in terms of American jurisprudence. There was a feeling that within the law, things that were legal were not necessarily providing for a place for what is called the counter story or a new story to give you more information. And so critical legal studies were created. Educators took a look at this and thought, maybe there's something we can learn from this as well. The example that I like to use is one that is very well known in critical legal studies. There was an automobile manufacturer you might have heard of. Mm, General Motors. Here's, okay. I see a couple hands. So think of any large automobile manufacturer. There were women of African descent, black American and from other places on the continent, that brought a legal suit because they were not being promoted in management. General Motors said, yes, we have done that. We have black people in management, and we also have women in management. Critical race theory said, well, let's take a special look at this through the, ra the lens of race and the lens of gender. Because somewhere at the intersection of that is the real story. 
And what they found was that while there were women in management, there were no black women in management. There were blacks in management, but as I said, they were only men. So the fact that race and gender at that point was used as a lens to look at that information, they found out something that they wouldn't normally have found out. And so scholars who then say, well then what does this mean for education? And while there are some limits, especially because there's not a direct overlay to education, each of the tenants help us to see that in order to be effective citizens, we can't just take one slice of the pie. We must look at it in its entirety and pay attention to the ways that the pieces intersect with each other. I don't know how you eat pie at your house and your family, but in my house, when you slice it, whatever falls out goes with your piece of pie. So you, you get all, all of the, so if it's apple pie, you know, with my, I would slice it and if some little bits fall in the pan, I get all of that because it belongs to my, my piece. Even though my sister says it belongs to her piece, I'm sorry about that if it fell out of you. It's, it's, it all cold goes together. So we can't take just one slice because it's all connected in particular kinds of ways. And if you think about driving, where there's an intersection, it's in the intersection that you are everywhere and nowhere. If you were to call someone, if you're standing in the middle of an intersection and they say, where are you? You usually will say two sh the names of two streets. I am here and I am here because I am at that intersection. And, and that was, that's what critical race theory does. It helps you to say, if a student is living in a rural part of the country, and there's a student who lives in an urban area, then maybe it's in those two locations, along with ethnicity, that we will examine what is happening in the classroom and make decisions about our teaching. The personal stories of lived experiences that are analyzed through critical theory, I will call it, perspectives, would include more than just a study of history and those timelines. It will lead us to ask what are the stories, the counter stories, that match the educational endeavors. Social justice theory can facilitate a retooling or revisioning of what it means to be an effective citizen in the face of injustices and highlight with explicit clarity the barriers to full civic participation. Notably, we can add social activism as a tenet of critical race theory but it would definitely have um, application as in other areas. I will now move to talk about the examples that I mentioned. A look at race narratives for enslaved Africans from the Americas are not new. The Mississippi Freedom Schools, which were specialized schools to help African Americans learn how to read, those narratives are not new. But I will use them to demonstrate how when matched with social justice, the needs of a constitutional democracy are met. Many are aware of, of the dangers of the enslaved Africans and the antebellum U.S. South. To learn to read and write could mean death. 
while there are not as many stories, there are stories that show that some did learn to read and there are some that died because of it. It's further documented that those who learned to read and write often taught others and were able to gain positions of leadership after slavery was abolished. Looking at the documents, as a social studies person I would do, there are over 3,000 responses from ex-slaves that participated in what was called the Federal Writers Project. And it revealed that over 5% mentioned that they had learned to read and write as enslaved people. Many of those enslaved that learned to read and write are most interesting because the major book of reading was the Bible. The accounts support that teaching was an acceptable female function, and many women taught slaves to read and write without being stopped. Now the connections to just learning how to read when matched with civic life shows how that it opened up multiple ways to act for social justice. For an example, many who were enslaved who became literate opened schools. Some of them became community leaders. It was, an, uh, it was apparent that the connection between literacy, public leadership, and civic participation, they were all intersected together. So after slavery, many blacks who learned reading and writing skills as slaves used their skills, as I said, in public leadership. Frederick Douglass, a name that many know. Su Susie King Taylor, a name that is not as familiar. She founded a, a black college. The point being that social justice matched with literacy moved people to engage and be in civic life different. And so the question becomes, as we teach, whatever the content area may be, and infuse social justice, will we see different outcomes as it relates to civic participation or what it means to be a citizen? The next story is of Septima Clark. She used civic education as a means to liberate and empower the fight against segregation and racial discrimination. The stories relate that she had a lot of courage, a lot of faith, a lot of patience, skill, and intellect. But most importantly, she was able to make the connections between literacy, the fight for justice, and access to political life in the US. And it was the combination of those things that helped her move forward with many of the initiatives, the NAACP, the national, which is the National Association for Advancement of Colored People. And even later in her life, she continued to have a mission that civic education and literacy were important for work related to social justice and eliminating oppression. The question for us is, how do we make those connections? The next one I'll talk about is the Freedom Schools of Mississippi. This was in 1964. There was a man by the name of Charles Cobb who had decided he could no longer be silent. The conditions in Mississippi were lacking, lack, I'm sorry, likened to a rotting shack, he called it. He believes that this was an analog to a rotting America. Charles Cobb's mission was to make sure that all black Americans over the age of 21 who were living in Mississippi would have the right to vote. 
And so this original plan for the Mississippi Freedom Schools was more than just about learning how to read. It was learning to read, to engage in civic life, and to fight injustice. The curriculum was rooted in history of Mississippi, but this was a time where learning, I mean, being able to vote required that you pass a literacy test. And so even though in normal school situations, those two things were not tied together, he created these schools as community schools to say we must pay attention that if you don't learn to read, you will not be able to engage in civic participation, of which voting was a major thing. So while there was a curriculum, thank you. So while there was a curriculum related to reading, there was also questions that were asked like, what does the majority culture have that we want? What does the majority culture have that we, won't, we don't want? And what do we have that we want to keep? Many of those students that participated in the Freedom Summer Schools had aspirations to leave the state as soon as they were old enough to go. But there were also many who at the end of that summer decided to stay and to help with literacy activities because they saw a connection between fighting injustice. So I'm gonna move along here. They also learned a lot about the, the types of things that they read were connected, again, to the constitutional democracy. So while they could have readers, I grew up with, with a reader that was called Fun with Dick and Jane, that I didn't enjoy reading too much. They switched those readings of early primers with things like the Constitution. And even very young children learned that they had constitutional rights and privileges that were being denied. The act of becoming a citizen was at the core of all inquiry. The students were asked to interrogate, interrogate and to ask questions. They learned about redressing their grievances, and in that particular time, the students actually wrote letters to the, United, the President of the United States asking for what is called a redress of grievances in our Constitution. I mentioned those three examples because it pushes me to ask particular kinds of questions. If as educators we leave out stories of empowerment from oppressed groups and we continue to teach and to shape the things that we are teaching, exclusive rather than inclusive of those stories, the question is, what is our real objective? What is our real mission of school? Critical race theory acknowledges that there's some racialized constructs in American society that are endemic, that are a part of it. It perpetuates oppression. Looking at social justice theoretical approaches acknowledges that any approach that is unjust, or it is unjust unless it filters through the perspectives of the people who experience the injustice. So who's telling the story? If I'm learning about rural America, am I learning about rural America from people who live in the city, in urban centers? Or is there a way to infuse stories that are told by those who actually live the experience? Educators' approaches to civic education 
to social justice and to critical race theory can help as it relates to what we often call a democratic imperative as a part of a constitutional democracy it's our obligation there is an an old proverb that I'm not sure translates my father also told me not to do this that the apple does not fall far from the tree yes Yay. I would suggest that our efforts in education have not fallen far from their development of sometimes racism, ethnocentrism, sexism, homophobia, classism, and the list just continues. The failure to recognize that the ideals of justice and equity for all cannot be achieved without fundamental change to our conceptualization, the way that we are going to think about social justice. And it doesn't matter where we are in the world. If we don't think differently about it, what it means to be socially just, it will be a mistake. And I would suggest that our educational endeavors will not move very far. The failure to recognize that the historical influences of ethnocentrism and xenophobia or bigotry and prejudice, sexism, all of those things, geography in urban and rural areas, in American society and educational systems all over the world, and I would suggest that the same is true in Poland, again, would be a mistake. To that end, educators, and researchers must engage in deeper explorations of the relationship of becoming an effective citizen, social justice, and ethnically diverse, inclusive experiences of the teachers and the children that they teach. The development of critical pedagogies, critical ways of teaching for classroom practice continues to be a worthwhile mission for education. The project then is more than just the socially, whoops, lost my place. Sorry. One minute. If you ever meet my father, don't tell him this happened. The project then is more than just the social construction of a socially just world. It is the construction of a socially just reality. It is an unending project of democratic transformation in many spaces. Understanding what it means to be a citizen, yes, that can help us within a, within a constitutional democracy. But be, as long as we have issues of race and social class and ethnicity and age and gender attraction and geography in between us and what that means it will continue to be a challenge i could share examples with you all day long i have lots of stories but the question means this can we provide a space of possibility a space of promise for those that you meet every single day in your classrooms and with the teachers that you are teaching. In America, it has been historical that African Americans and Native Americans are not always in the center, that there is a pushing to the margins and an invisibility. So the big question for you here is who are your African Americans? Who are your Native Americans? Only you can answer that question. It might be with civic education. It might be with social justice education. It might be with using critical race theory. But I believe that you're gathered here tonight because you are ready to see some change. Otherwise, why would you be in this hot room before dinner? having these conversations. 
If you are going to think differently about education in Poland, that this country can live up to its promise to your citizens, the promise and possibility of this democratic ideal that has been the establishment of political freedom, free elections, the transition to a market economy, and the opening of opportunities for private entrepreneurship, and the list goes on. Yes, those are freedoms. In closing, I will quote a scholar and friend, Gloria Latson Billings. She once talked about the educational debt that is owed to those who are pushed to the margins in education, be it social class or geography or race. She stated that, and I quote, the primary mission of the public school is to make citizens. What kind of citizens can we make if we regularly tell, and I would add show, some students that they are less worthy, less deserving, and less likely to be full-fledged citizens who will know what it means to participate in a democratic, multicultural society, end quote. I say to you, Poland, how will you answer that question? Thank you. Tylko dwa słowa jeszcze i będę mówił po angielsku, bo chyba nasi zagraniczni partnerzy nie mają słuchawek, a państwo macie. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia, for reminding us how social justice and education are connected. And Thank you also for uh, continuing the theme that is very important for us here. And uh, last year, Kathleen Lynch from Ireland was talking about similar issues, and she said about the necessity of a changing the compass, that we should stop fight with inequality and unfairness. We should start to avoid it, that we spend a lot of energy and then a lot of effort to fight with the consequences of our wrong actions. And it is much, much, much too late when we try to fix what we destroyed. That we need to think about social justice, fairness, solidarity earlier. That, that this would be much more effective, much more effective behavior than fixing this, what we destroyed before. And, uh, I think that we need to ask that question, who, who are Polish, African American every day? Because one of the most tragic thing in education is when teachers and other people believe that there are some characteristics that are inherited and that that is somebody else's fault that he or she is not successful. And the problem is, that it is not fault of individuals. It is fault of societies that do not remember about social justice. So thank you for reminding us of this. Bardzo dziękujemy. Przychodzi czas na kolację, ale po kolacji przypominam, że zapraszamy na panel dyskusyjny. O godzinie 20. O 19. Bardzo dziękuję. Wobec tego o 20 być może będzie drugi. Oczywiście o 19. Zapraszam.